uh, guys that have written books that resonate with my spirit, and uh, all of us have special authors that we love that they write and, and if they resonate with us, the people that resonate with me may not resonate with you, but I've got a list of about five or six guys when they write books, I'm trying to get them before they're ever out in the public to read them. Uh, and this week we had a gentleman who came and spoke to our leadership team, and his name is Erwin McManus. Uh, he's a, a pastor in California, in Los Angeles. He pastors one of the largest churches in America, but he ministers to all of the famous people in Hollywood. Uh, and so it's pretty cool, the books that he's written have really resonated with me. And about, I don't know, eight years ago, nine years ago, I read one of his books, and there was a comment in one of the books that God's really been speaking to me. A couple of weeks ago, you heard me mention this, this, this statement. I think I made it twice here, and I, and I shared with you during our, our intimate times with the Lord that you are chosen. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Remember me telling you that, that you are chosen? And the first time I said that, God said, Jimmy, hold on to that. And about a month later, I said it again, and just in our time, I thought the Holy Spirit just wanted me to tell you that you are chosen. Amen. We have been chosen by God. And, and, and again, I just remember the Holy Spirit saying, hold on to that. There's a time I want to use that. Well, this morning is that time. Amen. Amen. This morning is that time. And for the next couple of weeks, I want to talk about this whole thought of the fact that you and I have been chosen by God. And I can't think of any better testimony than the one that we've heard this morning of a young lady that's been chosen by God and her destiny's been put in place and the enemy tried to snatch that out of the, of the Lord's hand and, and God said, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. That's my daughter. And you can't have her because she's been chosen by me. What an incredible story of God's love and relentless pursuit of us. How many of you know that God pursues you? How many of you know this morning God pursues you? God is chasing after you today. God is pursuing you this morning. As you, as you sit here at the ocean today and you think you're sitting in the, the middle of another Sunday morning church service, the Lord is relentlessly pursuing you. He's wanting to talk to you today because He loves you. Today the Lord loves you. Amen. Well, in this person's book, one of the books I read is called Chasing Daylight. There's a simple thought that says that the most, the, the greatest spiritual activity that we will ever engage in. Anybody know what that is? If you had to say what's the, what's the most spiritual activity you could engage in, the deepest spiritual activity we could ever engage in. Many, many of you would say, oh, that's easy, Pastor Jimmy, that's prayer. That's the most spiritual thing we can do is pray. Some would say, it, oh, it's, it's worship, obviously, duh. All of the worshipers, all the music people in the house, they say, well, that's worship. That's the greatest spiritual thing we could do is worship. But for those of you that are the theologians, you would say, well, it's the Word of God. Yeah. It's the Word of God. Read God's Word. That's the most spiritual thing you can do. Well, there's this thought that really pushed me a few years ago, and it's pushing me even more because it was talked about this week, that the greatest spiritual activity we will ever engage ourselves in is the activity of choice. That the biggest spiritual act that we will ever do is to choose. If you look in Scripture in Genesis chapter 2, you will see that the first thing God commanded Adam was to choose. He said, I've placed you in this garden, and you have all of this that you can choose from. The only one you cannot choose. Is this. But he said, other than that, choose. Anything else in the garden belongs to you. Just choose. And what does Adam do? Choose. Chooses the wrong one. We laugh, but isn't that human nature? I mean, as even as kids, when mom and dad say, you can have anything but this, what is the first thing you want? 
Yeah. The one thing they said you can't have. And we, I mean, even when we're older, it's like that. We have this tendency to, to be curious about all the things they say we shouldn't do. And, and that's where a lot of us get in trouble. And this isn't Confession Sunday, but you know what I'm talking about, right? All those things you know you're not supposed to do, we know we shouldn't do. That there's still this human curiosity to want to check it out. And uh, But this whole concept of the greatest spiritual act that we would ever be, be able to engage in being choice is really pretty interesting. Because when it comes down to it, the act of reading your Bible is a choice. I know, I'm feeling good. I'm getting amen from Carla this morning. And I'm like, whoo, I'm walking on water over here. <laughs> the, the act of praying is a choice. You, before you pray, you choose to pray. As you're getting ready to come to the ocean this morning, you're choosing to come to church. So before any action, there is a choice to act. So as awkward as it may be, and as much as it may mess up our theology, and it may not seem really, really spiritual, it, there may be something to this whole point that the greatest spiritual act we'll ever engage in is choosing. The word choose is in, in Scripture several times, and, and in many places, and, and I think, choose you this day in whom you will serve, as for me and my house. Joshua said that. He said, you choose this day who you're going to serve, but for me and my house. We're going to serve the Lord. Today I set before you life and death. But choose life so that you may live. To choose. Before we perform any act for the Lord, we choose to do that. And the cool thing about that whole issue of choice, for me, it's a reciprocation of the fact that God chose me. God chose me. In fact, in, in the New Testament, we find two verses that speak to this pretty plainly. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says that you are a chosen people. You, speaking of, of you today, from the front row to the back row, you are a chosen people. Amen. You are a royal priesthood. Amen. Amen. A holy nation, a people belonging to God. God chose you today. Amen. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what your situation is this morning. I don't know. I know that there are people in our church that, that are struggling. I know that there are some people that are hurting. But I, I want you to know this morning more than anything else, that you are chosen by God. And though you may not feel like it this morning, and you may not feel like you matter, and, and you may feel like your, your life's insignificant, can I, can I read those words to you again? And, and instead of saying you, you can put your name in there. And, and you can say this of yourself and declare it that, that you are chosen. You are a chosen people. Brenda, you are a chosen person today. Eric, you are holy this morning. Peter, you belong to God. That's powerful, Sammy. You are chosen. You are holy. You are royal, Sheena. You are royalty. Coming and going to work with teenagers, you are royalty. Chosen by God. 
John chapter 15, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you, Stephen. I was a teenager when I remember hearing that verse for the first time. I'll never forget when and where I heard that verse for the first time. I was in Dallas, Texas, of all places, at a youth revival with my youth group. Tell you the person who preached the message, his name was Spencer Nordyke. And I'll, I'll never forget him opening up his Bible and having us turn to this. In this passage of scripture, Jesus said that you did not choose me, but I chose you. Amen. And I have never forgotten that. I didn't know, I mean, I was like 15 at the time. I didn't know then that God was going to call me into ministry, but I, I promise you, <laughs> the day that he did, that verse kept ringing in my mind. Remember when I told you, Jimmy, that you didn't choose me, but I chose you? And I think there's just this one thought this morning that I want to push home with you is this fact that you are chosen this morning. Amen. That you are a chosen people. One verse in Scripture says you are a you are a chosen generation. Amen. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people belonging to God. Even Jesus himself says, you did not choose me. But I chose you. And how amazing is it that the God of this universe, the creator of this universe, the incredible God, the eternal King, the Master Creator, chose you. How humbly. How powerful. And why? Why did he choose you today, church? Why did he look down at the ocean and say, I choose you? Because he loves you today. Amen. Amen. That's why. There's a beauty in simplicity. There's a beauty in simplicity. It's amazing to think that the God of the universe would choose me. But somehow in the midst of my trial, in the middle of the storm, He chooses us. Jeremiah 31 1 says that I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. He loves you today. Yeah. Yes. Uh, some of you, if you're visiting here this morning, you, you have to know my personality. I, I am not one of those gooey, gooey kind of guys, necessarily. I'm not that. But God is speaking deep down in my heart to tell you today that He loves you. Amen. And that the greatest message of the cross is a message of love. Amen. When Jesus spread his arms out on the cross, he was not surrendering, he was choosing. He was choosing. He wasn't surrendering to the situation, he was commanding it. So maybe I am the way I am this morning because this message is so overwhelming. Think that the God of the universe would choose me and use me. Who is man that you are mindful of him? But 
yet, because he loves us, he chooses us. Sometimes it's in the middle of our loneliness, in the midst of the crowd. I think back to the story of, of Jesus, and he yells in the middle of all the hundreds of people that are crowded around him, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples look at Jesus, are you crazy, Jesus? There's a hundred people here, everybody's touching you. What do you mean, who touched you? And Jesus says, no, one person touched me. Yeah. He turned and he looked at the woman with the issue of blood. He said, it was you. How powerful it is to think that all these people in this room could be saying the name Jesus, but, but he turns and he looks at me and says, Jimmy, I hear you. I hear you. All these people are speaking, but I hear you. All these people are, worship, are worshiping me today, but, but Jimmy, I hear you. I think you would look at all of us this morning and say, I hear you. Eugenia, I hear you this morning. In the midst of all of these people, I hear your voice. I see you. He says, I love you with an everlasting love. 1 John 4.18 says, A perfect love casts out all fear. Amen. So many of us are afraid to engage in a relationship with the Lord because it makes us vulnerable. It makes us susceptible to, to His commands in our life and, and those things that maybe we may not want to do. And so we become fearful in, in engaging into relationship with the Lord or we become fearful of engaging into relationship with people. But the Bible says that perfect love, which is the love of the Lord, casts out all fear. And we need not be afraid. So you can be afraid of everybody in this room, and that's okay. I totally understand. I've been afraid of people before. I've been in places where I don't trust anybody. The Bible says that the perfect love of Jesus casts out all fear, and that there is no, no fear in his love. Amen. And he chose you today, and he wants you to engage and experience that love. Ephesians 3 talks about the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Ephesus about the love of Jesus and said this love is wide. It's vast. It says that it's deep. Reaching down to the deepest areas of the darkest corners of our soul, the love of God is deep. And there's no depth that you cannot experience the love of God. His love is high. It's far reaching. Yes. The love of God is far reaching. Amen. It's a love that surpasses our knowledge. Paul says the love of Jesus surpasses our understanding and our wisdom. You, you may not always understand it, and there's going to be things about the love of God you may not understand. It surpasses human knowledge and and our, our finite minds cannot comprehend the vastness of the love of God. But can I tell you this morning, you don't have to. All you have to understand is the fact that he loves you right where you are today. Amen. Amen. And that he chose you this morning. Amen. Are you hearing the church? Amen. Are you hearing the church? Amen. Then you say, Pastor Jimmy, this may be the worst message you've ever preached. Uh, I want you to know. I want you to understand. I want you to hear me. So many people come to church week after week and never hear that God loves them. Amen. The greatest message I can share with you today is a simple fact that Jesus loves you. And the greatest thing that you can do as a follower of Christ is to choose to receive it. Yes. Amen. There's nowhere that you're at today that the love of God cannot reach you. There's no distance. He will not go. I think you heard that even this morning through the testimony of a 15-year-old girl that there's no distance that Jesus will not travel to find you. Yes. yes. If you will make yourself aware that he is pursuing you today. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians that love is patient. Somebody say Amen. Amen. Are you glad God's patient with you? Amen. Amen. Anybody glad God is patient with yes. you? Yes. Love is patient. Amen. 
Love is kind. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. The love of God is not rude. Somebody say amen. 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 You ever been in a church and somebody's rude to you? <laughs> oh man. It is not self seeking. Yes. It's not easily angered. Amen. It keeps no record. Yes. God, would you help us be a people that keep no record? Amen. amen. Oh man. That message has preached for years. Mm-hmm. Are you one that keeps record? <laughs> yes. Just be honest. It's between you and God. We're not confessing. <laughs> you just answer that question. Keeps no record of wrongs. Let it go. <laughs> for real. Let it go. The score's going to be erased in the end. You know that, don't you? Mm -hmm. The score that you're keeping in your head of all those people that did you wrong, when Jesus comes, it's not even going to be there anymore. So just erase it and save the space for something good. Amen. Just erase it. Erase all those numbers and all those check marks and just write the word love on there or something. I don't know. I like this, so the love of Jesus never fails. Yes, the love of Jesus never fails, Liz. Amen. It never fails us. Amen. Though we may fail over and over and over again, and we will, we will, we will. I'm, t- I'm here to tell you today, church, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. And I promise, before I lay my head to bed tonight, I probably will fail. There's a pretty high likelihood, Jackson, that I'm going to blow it somewhere in the course of the day today, and, and I'm going to fail somewhere. I'll have this stupid thought that's not of God, or I'll open my mouth and insert my foot, maybe both of them before the day's over, and I'll say something that's not good, or I'll think something that's not good, or, or I'll have this intention, Brenda, that's not holy, and I'll fail. But the love of Jesus never fails. Amen. It never makes mistakes. Yes. But it is consistent and it is constant and it is everlasting and it's from glory to glory and it's from, from the beginning to the end. And the love of Jesus never fails. And as simple as it may seem and as as awkward as it may seem, that is simply my message today. Is that you are chosen and He loves you. And that the greatest thing that we can do in return is to choose Him. Oh, there's a lot of spiritual things you can engage in. And and those things are good, and you should pray, and and you should read your word, and I hope that you do. And and you should engage in spiritual community, and you should serve, and, and you should minister. And those things should all come out of your relationship with the Lord. But the reality is this, is that the first thing you have to do is choose today. You have to choose Him. And whether you've been serving Him for for one day or or been in a relationship with Him for 20, 30 years, you still are faced every day with the choice to serve or not to serve, to love Him or not to love Him, to give your life to Him or to not give your life to Him. You wake up every day with the power of choice. And if the reality is that our future is a sum of our choices. Anybody ever heard that? Your future is going to be a sum of the choices that you make today. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah. And if we really desire the Lord's will for our life tomorrow, the next day, then we must choose Him today. Amen. It's the 
Because sometimes in church, everybody wants God's will for their life, but they're not willing to choose Him now. But the future that we walk into is the sum of the choices we make today. Yes. Yes. And can I tell you that from the beginning of creation, our Heavenly Father, God Almighty, chose us. Amen. And today we get the incredible, incredible privilege and opportunity to choose Him. Mm -hmm.